Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It's uh, good to see uh, you all here. Um, first of all, welcome to any guests we may have. Um, we'd like to, uh, everyone to fill out the yellow cards that are in the pew and drop those in the offering plate um, when that comes by a little bit later in the service. Uh, also, uh, welcome those who may be watching from home or wherever you're at on Facebook through our uh, live feed, uh, which can actually be watched at any time. But uh, however you've joined us, we're certainly glad that uh, you have. Um, the, the biggest announcement uh, as far as our uh, church activities are concerned is that Lent begins on Wednesday. There'll be a whole a series of activities uh, for Ash Wednesday and the following weeks of Lent. Uh, Starting out at noon, there will be a service here of ashes and communion also. Um, that'll be a brief devotional service that'll continue throughout uh, the, the following five Wednesdays of, of, of Lent. And then we have our afternoon, uh, excuse me, our evening service, um, beginning with a supper at 530 and worship at 630, um, using Holden evening prayer. And our theme this year is living in the covenant of our baptism. Those, those promises that we make in the affirmation of baptism service will form the themes for our five uh, midweek services. So um, hope that you make uh, that as part of your Lenten observance this year. Um, today, this afternoon, 3 o'clock, organ concert, our Organist director, music director Tom is going to be presenting a concert uh, of music uh, uh, composed entirely by African American composers. So, this in recognition of uh, Black History Month. So, thank you, Tom, for doing that, and we'll look forward to uh, hearing uh, that concert and hope that many of you will come out uh, for that. Okay, and then and just to kind of look ahead, uh, uh, beginning next week, we'll be, uh, we will be returning to communion by coming forward. Um, so one more, one more service this weekend uh, with in the pews, but beginning Ash Wednesday and beyond, uh, we'll be uh, coming forward, uh, recognizing that things are changing and uh, with regard to COVID, um, those of us up front will still be wearing masks uh, during distribution, so we still will be taking some precautions, but uh, trying to get back to some semblance of normal, which I think that is happening to a certain extent, um, but also uh, with the awareness that uh, we still need to be at least a little bit careful because uh, the virus is maybe not completely done with us yet on that, so but look forward to the time when that will happen. And of course, prayers, prayers today, prayers for Ukraine, um, evil, what is happening over there. And so the, that petition of the Lord's prayer, deliver us from evil, I think takes on added significance and meaning uh, for so many people there who are under attack um, uh, for no apparent reason other than they want to be free. They, they want to, their own self-expression. So uh, we remember um, those who are facing very difficult times in Ukraine. Okay, I think that's all we have by way of announcement. We'll begin with confession and forgiveness and let us stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. 
we confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. We sing the hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
The first reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 34. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come to him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out, and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. So Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is 2 Corinthians chapter twelve, chapter 3, verses 12 through chapter 4. Verses two, first two verses. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. Word of God, word of life. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message. Good morning. I'm so glad to see you this morning. I thought I was going to be giving my message to all of them, and I didn't think they'd want to answer all my questions this morning. So you ready to answer some questions and learn a really big word? Yeah? Thank you, Molly. So... Today is called the Transfiguration of Our Lord Sunday. Can you say that big word, transfiguration? Good job. You you nailed that. Good job. You want to teach? No? Okay. So transfiguration is defined as a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or spiritual state. So Jesus went up on a mountain with his disciples to pray, and they kind of thought they were going to have a getaway. And then there was this transfiguration of Jesus, and he shone like bright lights. And his clothing, everything was like whiter than white. And then Moses and Elijah appeared next to him. So what kind of things are white? candles. Yeah. I have a white bunny that's been spending the week with me. What else is white that maybe we, maybe, is there any left on the ground out there? Snow is white. Can you imagine, oh, ooh, pastor's got his stole there. That's white today. And if you notice, all of the colors around the church on the altar and the lectern and the pulpit have changed from green to white this week. So we are preparing to go into the 
um, season of Lent. And this week, we'll have a special church holiday called Ash Wednesday. And then we'll start the season of Lent. Have you heard of Lent before? Yeah. You know, it's a somber time where we focus and we reflect on Jesus. And some people may give up something or some people may add something to their lives. Like maybe they spend more time in prayer or they decide that they're going to share more kindness in the world. There's all kinds of different ways people celebrate Lent, but it's a time to focus and a time of reflection. Will you join me in prayer? And I invite the congregation to join along. Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son Jesus to save us. Help us journey with him to the cross this Lent. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Now about eight days after the sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were terrified and entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. How good, Lord, to be here. Yet we may not remain, but since you bid us leave the mount, come with us to the plain. Amen. Have any of you gone traveling lately? I'm sure that uh, some of you have. Some have perhaps been on a long car uh, trip or an airline trip to a distant state. On February 13th, I traveled by air to Denver to attend a continuing education event at Winter Park Ski Resort, an event that included both learning sessions and time spent skiing the slopes. There were many preparations for this trip, registration for the event itself, airline reservations, equipment rental, ski lift pass purchase, and a long packing list, making sure I had everything I needed for six days of activity, both on the mountain and off. When we take longer trips, the level of preparation increases. The to-do list becomes longer, as does the what-to-bring list. We might get out the bigger, the larger suitcase. There may be deadlines to meet in terms of passports, for example, or Decisions to make regarding when to buy those plane tickets, wondering if there isn't a better deal lurking around an internet corner somewhere. Next year, there will be another preparation detail, making sure your driver's license has been issued using enhanced identification credentials, such as a birth certificate 
or passport. Beginning May 3rd, 2023, every air traveler 18 years of age and older will need what's called a real ID compliant driver's license, state-issued enhanced driver's license, or another acceptable form of ID to fly within the United States. So make sure you get that done if you're planning to fly next year. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's the last Sunday of Epiphany, the Sunday before Lent begins this coming Wednesday, and we've already mentioned that, of course, Ash Wednesday. One could say that the Transfiguration was a major part of Jesus' preparation for the journey that he would take to Jerusalem and to the cross to suffer and die there as Messiah. When I traveled to Colorado two weeks ago, I needed to confirm with event leaders when my flight would be arriving so they could pick me up and give me a ride from the airport to the event in Winter Park. When I returned to Ohio on Friday, I had to confirm with the airline that my flight was still scheduled. Remember, there was some bad weather uh, you know, on Thursday. Uh, flights were canceled on Thursday, and I was worried that maybe it would be canceled for Friday, too. I'd be stuck in an airport somewhere. Men Jesus, too, needed confirmation, assurance, and approval from his father to take the trip that he no doubt knew he was embarking on, the trip to Jerusalem and the cross. Now, as I've already re, uh, reminded you several times this morning, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and I hope that all of you, as much as you are able, will come to worship that day, 6.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary, noon here in the sanctuary, so that you can mark the beginning of your pilgrimage with Jesus to Jerusalem. I remember when I was a kid, my brother Phil, who is two years older than I, and he had his own group of friends, he would go off with those friends to play. And I remember wanting so much to go along with him, to be a part of whatever fun that he and his friends had planned. And I used to say, Phil, take me with you. In the same way, during this season of Lent, as Jesus begins his journey to Jerusalem, I hope that we can have that same desire to go along and for us to say, Jesus, take me with you. And so I'd like to focus today on our coming Lenten pilgrimage, our journey with Jesus to the cross. Our coming Lenten pilgrimage is, first of all, a going up, a going up. For centuries, people have had a desire to climb mountains and they have done so. And for almost 100 years, the ultimate goal of mountain climbing was to climb the world's highest mountain, Mount Everest. George Herbert Lee Mallory was an English mountaineer who took part in the first two British expeditions to Mount Everest in the early 1920s. And although he is not known for being the first person to have succeeded in reaching the top of Everest, he is known for famously replying to the question, why do you want to climb Mount Everest? With the response, because it is there, which has been called the most famous three words in mountaineering. Certainly, because a mountain is there is good enough reason to climb it. My roommate in Colorado recently a young seminarian, just in his 20s, climbed the mountain using his cross-country skis. He went from the very bottom to the very top, up to 12,000 feet, with special attachments on the bottom of his skis that you know, enable him to go up, and then they catch the snow uh, so that he doesn't slide backwards. He walked up the mountain, he climbed the mountain and then took those things off and then skied down. I am in awe of him. I am in awe of anyone that climbs a mountain. And those who participate in that sport often describe it almost spiritual experience and an 
encounter with God that comes from looking down from the highest peak at the wonder and beauty of the surrounding mountains. And I was up high enough to, to see some of that beauty. I didn't go all the way to the top like my roommate did, even on the, sky, even on the chairlift. But the view from the top is still the same, one that inspires awe. In the Bible, mountains are often associated with encounters with the divine. That is certainly true regarding Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses went up the mountain, and in his encounter with God was given the Ten Commandments. In the Gospels, going up a mountain is related to several different kinds of spiritual experiences. Luke's account of the transfiguration has Jesus taking Peter, James, and John, and the four of them go up a high mountain. And then Luke describes the experience we have come to know as the transfiguration, the appearance of Jesus' face changing and his clothes becoming almost blindingly white. We read of the appearance of Moses and Elijah Peter's desire to build three booths and the voice from the cloud declaring about Jesus, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. That must have been quite a mountaintop experience for Peter, James, and John. Text tells us that as Peter was speaking, a cloud came, overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And then, interestingly enough, they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. That is really kind of a puzzling and perplexing part of this story. Our coming Lenten pilgrimage is also a going up, a going up to be with God for guidance and assurance, just as it was for the disciples. We climb the mountain by doing things that we don't normally do otherwise. We attend midweek worship, where we not only worship and in that way encounter God, but also seek to be taught by God. This year, the theme for our midweek Lenten worship is continuing in the covenant of baptism, and we'll focus on the five promises that are made in the service of affirmation of baptism. Another thing that we do during the season of Lent is to give something up that's important to us. It might be chocolate or coffee or meat or sweets of any kind. We also make an extra effort to be more faithful in our devotional life. If you have a computer and internet, go to a search engine and type Lenten devotionals and you will have enough resources to make Lent, a season of climbing the mountain, of going up to be with God for guidance and assurance. Our coming Lenten pilgrimage is not only a going up, it is a going back. When Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the mountain along with Peter, James, and John, they, brought, they were brought back in touch with their roots. They were, were reminded of where they had come from. Some of you may remember the 1977 television series Roots, based on the novel of the same name by Alex Haley, which begins in Gambia, East Africa, as Kunta Kinte is sold into slavery and comes to America. And the series chronicles the many hardships faced by Kinte and his ancestors as they endured slavery and are later terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan. The story inspired many to become more aware of their roots. That's something that I've been become more interested in lately. I found a group on Facebook that is dedicated to tracing the genealogy of the group of people from Singsos, Norway, including my great-grandparents on my dad's side who immigrated to the United States and settled by a lake that was part in Minnesota and part in South Dakota. I've been begun reading some of the literature that is available regarding the history of this immigration and their travels across the prairie in covered wagons to claim their homesteads. 
through internet information on the internet and from people in this group, I'm now able to trace parts of my ancestry back to the late 1600s and also identify the specific farms from which my great-grandparents emigrated in the late 1880s. I'd like to travel to Norway someday and visit these places from which my ancestors came. Something for my bucket list, I guess. Going back to the past to discover our roots, it can make us more sure of our identity. I'm sure that's some of what was happening for Peter, James, and John as they stood up there on that mountain. As Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus, Moses represented to them the law and, and the Torah, the first five books of Moses. Elijah represented for them the prophets and the prophetic tradition in Scripture. For Peter, James, and John, I'm sure this was a reminder for them of their roots as they look back on this experience. And as they did so, I'm sure it must have cemented in their minds the connections between Jesus and God's ancient promises of deliverance. And I hope that happens for us as well, that Lent can be a season where we return to our spiritual roots. I've already mentioned the ways that we go up the mountain in Lent through Lenten worship, disciplines, and devotionals. But that can also be a way for us to go back to our biblical roots. Lent has traditionally been a season of teaching and learning, and hopefully that learning will include learning more about the Bible and its message. Several years ago, there began a church-wide initiative called Bible Book of Faith. It was an initiative to encourage the Bible for us to make the Bible the first language of faith. And in order for that to happen, we need to open it and read it and know what's in it. For example, in the Old Testament, we learn of how God rescued the people of Israel from slavery, then rescued them again at the Red Sea, led them through the wilderness and into the promised land. As we learn more and more about that story, then we come to a better understanding of how God has rescued us from slavery, slavery to sin, brought us through a water rescue, which we call baptism and leads us to the promised land, which is our heavenly home. Our coming Lenten pilgrimage is a going up and also a going back to our spiritual roots. Now, you've heard the saying that what goes up must come down, right? Well, that saying applies here as well. Our coming Lenten pilgrimage is not only a going up and a going back, it is also a going down the mountain to witness, serve, and carry a cross. And that raises the whole question of who gets transfigured. Well, Jesus, certainly. But in what way were the disciples transfigured or transformed? And how about us? Laurel Dykstra, a scripture and justice educator living in Vancouver, British Columbia, wrote the following in an article for Sojourners magazine. She said, my first night at Guadalupe House, a Catholic worker transition house where I spent nearly 10 years, I sat at the wobbly leg table amid a circle of men's faces, black and brown and white, and looked at the peeling linoleum tattered sheer yellow curtains, broken couches, and roach-filled corners. I had never seen a place so ugly. After a week of hospitality, laughter, community, and connection, I sat in the same seat and caught myself thinking, what a kind and homey room this is. Transfigured. So I wonder, Dykstra continues, in Luke's story of the mountain, was it Jesus who changed, or was it that John, James, and Peter could now see the face of God shining in the man they knew? When they came down from the mountaintop, did they take with them their new capacity 
to see into the low places and crowded city streets? Can we? And when we see the face of God shining through those who are familiar to us, do we truly, deeply listen to them? So far, Ms. Dykstra. Our coming Lenten pilgrimage. It all starts Wednesday as we humble ourselves a bit and allow ourselves to be marked with an ashen cross. As we are reminded not only of our mortality, but from whence the hope of eternal life comes. May it be for us a time of going up, of going back, and going down to witness, serve, and carry the cross. Amen. We sing the hymn. Let us join together as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Transform us by your greatness, O God. Send us down the mountain to share joy with all people. Make us agents of change, confident that your hope will vanquish despair and your goodness will conquer evil. God of grace, hear our prayer. The mountains and valleys sing your praise. Dazzle us with your presence in every landscape. Bluffs built by ancient glaciers, canyons carved by flowing rivers, flat horizons with uninterrupted views, and sands shaped by ocean tides. God of grace, hear our prayer. You love justice and establish equity. Strengthen the leaders of local governments, community nonprofits, and grassroots campaigns. Bless them with gifts of integrity, creativity, and sound conscience. Build up safe and joyful communities where all people may thrive. God of grace, hear our prayer. Heal those who are in distress and stand in need of your healing presence. We remember especially Harry, Richard, Joanne, Amy, Paige, and David. Give patience to those waiting for answers. Grant hope to those who have reached the limits of treatment. Give compassionate hearts to those who accompany loved ones through illness and uncertainty. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Today we shout Alleluia from the mountaintop. This week we enter the wilderness of Lent. Bless all who prepare and lead in worship during this change of season. Pastors, deacons, musicians, and all who contribute to our worship life. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of the Ukraine. Move those who wish to do them harm to lay down their weapons and seek a way of peace. We pray for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide the leaders of all nations. God of grace, hear our prayer. Blessed are they who listened to Christ's voice in this life and now rest with him. Transform us from glory to glory and give us your peace that we do not lose heart. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with those around you. It is my hope that one day soon we'll come back out into the center aisle and really greet each other again. Please be seated. Amen. Please be seated. We will now receive the offering. Would you please make sure at this time you filled out that yellow welcome card, card and place it in the offering plate as it goes by.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to God's table. There is a place for you and enough for all. You may be seated at this time. I invite you to uh, prepare your elements for receiving. And I will invite you momentarily to eat and drink. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the richness of your grace in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. God who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing the hymn.
Go with Christ into a weary world. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank you.